Welcome to the Broken Mirror Story Event. The Return by Kevin Anderson With no memory of what had come before, I awoke in a strange village, face down, on a catacomb floor. Surrounded by faces, each one as plain as the other, it took but a moment to realize they'd all spawn from the same viral mother. You shouldn't have tried to leave, they chanted. It's a miracle you're still alive. I hung my head as the memories returned. There was no escape from the hive. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 2, number 1, page 57. I'm your ever-loving host, Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. You just heard The Return by Kevin Anderson. A poem. (laughs) This is the first of two episodes dedicated to the Broken Mirror Story event, a contest we had. Is it a contest? A competition we had. Is it a competition? (laughs) It's something. Yeah, you could say it's a competition. A competition we had here on the Dune Steve, wherein the subject of the story is someone arrives in town and discovers that everyone there is exactly the same. That's right, and we threw it open to everybody. Give us your interpretation of this theme. Someone arrives in town and discovers that everyone there is exactly the same. So in today's episode, we have three entrants. In the Broken Mirror Story event. So we've got two more stories. If you're one of those wonderful listeners that likes to turn it off as soon as the story is up, we've still got two more to go in this one. So uh, listen just a little while longer. So the next story we have for you is Scriptopia by Michael A. Kachula. Michael is a retired tech writer. His fiction has won first place in eight contests and placed in seven others. He's also won Editor's Choice Awards four times. His stories have been published in 114 magazines and 30 anthologies in Australia, Canada, England, India, Scotland, and the U.S. (sighs) Prolific. He's authored a book of flash and microfiction stories called A Full Deck of Zombies and 61 Speculative Fiction Tales. A second book, The Area 51 option and 70 speculative fiction tales was released just this week. Check the show notes for links to where you can pick those up. We'd like to thank Josh Roseman, Nicole Sudeth, Liz Mirzievsky, Marcus Brodeur, and Abigail Hilton for lending their voices to today's episode. And the music for all the stories in today's episode is by Roger Subirana. It's good stuff. Follow the links in the show notes to check it out. Scriptopia by Michael A. Kachula. Hey there. Called an armed guard. You lost? Not exactly, said Brett Harding. Uh, According to my historical research, this is where the town of Stepford once stood. Never heard of it. That was the creepy town where guys turned their wives into robots, making them ravishing creatures of pleasure, where all the women made endless batches of chocolate chip cookies. The government discovered what was going on, destroyed the town, and jailed all the men. It happened about 30 years ago. Doesn't ring a bell. What's the name of this place? Scriptopia. Hmm. It's not on my Connecticut road map. This town's very exclusive, has special status. They kept it off maps and the global positioning system. Everything behind this wall ain't part of Connecticut. Just like Washington, D.C. ain't part of Maryland. No wonder it isn't on my map. Is this some kind of hush-hush research center like Area 51? Not that I know of. All our residents are writers. What kind of writers? Fiction. Sounds interesting. How are my chances of getting inside? I'm Brett Hardy, instructor of modern history at Santa Bufuna College in California. Here's my ID. After scrutinizing Harding's ID... 
the guard said. We usually discourage visitors, but since you're a college teacher, maybe the sheriff will let you in. The guard mumbled into a cell phone. The sheriff wants to know if you've ever written a bestseller. Not yet, but I'm working on it. Sheriff Spitz says you can enter under certain conditions. Please raise your right hand. Are you now, or have you ever been, a writer of poetry, limericks, greeting card jingles, nursery rhymes, or song lyrics? No. Brett lied, figuring they'd never heard of his three books of esoteric, cryptic, noxious poetry. I'm obligated to warn you, poets are strictly forbidden in Scriptopia. Violation of town ordinances carries extremely stiff penalties. I understand. Can you point me to a coffee shop? I could use a good cup of brew after driving so long. Sure. This is Dostoyevsky Drive. Take this for about a mile, then turn left at Steinbeck Street. It's on the corner. Hemingway's Hashery. Oh, the sheriff said you can stay for only one hour. Better set a timer. He's one mean SOB. By the way, he writes Sacco detective novels. Brett almost blurted, Me too! A fib of monstrous proportions. He couldn't write a piece of readable prose if his life depended on it. But when it came to iambic pentameter... He was a master. The gate swung open. Brett drove down a tree-lined avenue. Get a load of that. He mumbled when he saw lampposts shaped like fountain pens. Beautiful brick homes came into view. The chimneys of some emitted puffs of gray smoke. He had to glance twice when a smoke cloud suddenly formed a bubble in which appeared the words, It was a dark and stormy night. Pulling over to the curb, Brett rubbed his eyes in disbelief. How are they doing that? When he looked again, the smoke was gone. But suddenly, a second smoke cloud rose from a different house. It formed into Brad dropped his hot hand on Chelsea's quivering thigh. Still another said the zombie's eyes glowed as his powerful fingers gripped Miss Potter's creamy neck. Holy smoke! Brett yelled, chills running down his spine. He couldn't wait to get inside the restaurant for a sanity check. The restaurant, shaped like a giant old-time manual typewriter, came into view. Once inside, he noticed the place was as quiet as an arctic graveyard. Everywhere he looked, customers were eating with one hand and scribbling in notebooks with the other. Even the kids... Mommy, what do you think of this sentence? A boy asked quietly. The werewolf grabbed the vampire and twisted his head off. Very nice, said a blonde woman, patting the boy's head. I think you should add some dialogue. Tell us what the werewolf said. And maybe you can include what the vampire was thinking as his head was being twisted. Then she quickly added, Better finish your fiction fries before they get cold and soggy. Brett chose a counter seat a few feet from the waitress who was writing furiously in a notebook. Glancing at Brett, she whispered, I'll be with you as soon as I finish this paragraph. After several minutes of boring silence, he absentmindedly tapped keys on the counter. Immediately, he was bombarded with shushing sounds and hostile stares. Uh, sorry, he mumbled. Finished, the waitress whispered, glancing at Brett. Sorry to make you wait. Didn't want to break my thoughts, been struggling over that paragraph all morning. Her happy face name tag announced Becky Bunky, author of The Moiling Mob, 10 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. Wow, he whispered. I see. Becky Bunky, the art she who wrote a biggie. What did you say? Oh, hell, I goofed. I said that I see that you've hit the big time with your book being a bestseller. No, you didn't. I distinctly heard you say something that sounded like a poem. You a poet? She yelled loudly. No, I'm a history teacher. Suddenly, customers surrounded Brett. You You a a poet? poet? They chanted in unison, repeating it a dozen times. You You a a poet? poet? 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 You a poet? The sheriff stormed in. Handcuffing Brett, he yelled. You were warned at the gate, Harding. We don't want any damn poets around here. We're all refugees from that abominable trash that uses countless meaningless, mind-bending words to say nothing. It's five years since somebody tried to sneak in here and convert us from prose writers to poetry hacks. 
Do you realize what you've done? Look at the kids here munching on hominem hamburgers, simile sausages, and personification pancakes. You've contaminated their malleable minds. Do you think we want them running around yelling, Rosy posy, chewy dewy, hokey smoky? It's downright pornographic, you sleazy malefactor. Searching Brett, the sheriff pulled a petite volume of sonnets from his coat pocket. <sighs> Here's proof, yelled the sheriff, holding the book high for all to see. Women shrieked, men blanched, oldsters threw up, parents shielded children's eyes to prevent trauma. That night, the townsfolk gathered to watch Brett Harding walk barefoot across ten feet of white-hot train rails. Wearing a dunce cap on which was written, Poet, Brett never got past the first few inches. When his feet burst into flames, he toppled head first into a pit of blazing embers. Look! Somebody yelled as a cloud of smoke rose from Brett's charred corpse. Inside the cloud appeared the words, A pox on thee for killing me. What does that say, Mommy? Nothing. It's just a stupid poem. It's a poem. The ravings of demons. You better forget you ever heard that terrible word. If I ever hear you saying it, I'll wash your mouth out with soap and sell you to the gypsies. Author's Note Here's what I had in mind when writing this urban fantasy. I wanted to write a satire about groups that isolate themselves and set up their own utopias, in which everyone is the same in some way. Also to show how utopian groups can conflict with the rest of society in strange and unusual ways. Finally, I wanted to poke fun at poets. Alright, welcome back. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that story. Wow, it's weird to be saying it. Hey, that was my only line. Back in the box, Clob. I hope you enjoyed Scriptopia. Yeah, it was good stuff. That's one of the first submissions that we received, if I remember right, for this event. I remember back when we first stuck our neck out and went ahead and went for this. I expected that we would get no submissions, or maybe one. So when this one came in, I was already ecstatic. Yes, sir, we have a winner! <laughs> so yeah, it was really cool, and the best part about it was it was good! It was fun! It was an enjoyable story. And you know, like the characters in this story, I too despise poetry. How about you, Rish? Oh, I absolutely flippin' hate poetry. In fact, you forced me, kicking and screaming, to accept Kevin's <laughs> little poem at the beginning. And in his defense, he told us that he also hates poetry. And I, you know what? That may, that may alienate listeners. I, when I say that I hate poetry, I just I, – I think it's utterly worthless. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. no. I, I, gosh, OK. Why do you hate poetry? It's just okay. not my thing. And maybe listeners have noticed this as we've gone through the year and some odd months – since we started this show, I like straightforward things. I like stories that are straightforward. It can be somewhat of uh, ambiguousness to it, but there's just nothing straightforward about poetry unless it's really, really bad poetry like somebody doing roses or red, violets or blue, blah, blah, blah. It's just not my thing. I just don't dig on that kind of stuff. I have written a lot of poetry, actually. But it's only when I've been like really into a girl. And what's funny is, and I don't know if it's funny, maybe everybody has experienced this, but when that infatuation with the girl is over, I, I cannot read that poetry. Oh, I, I wrote this song for the, the last girl that I was really digging back in L.A. And, oh, gosh, I don't even want to say it on the air. But, hey, we're all friends here. I recorded that song. <laughs> I did. I recorded it. And I've never once ever played it back ever so i have a recording of me singing this song <laughs> and it, it's it's still got dust on it I, I i can't even imagine that would be against the geneva convention type of torment for me to have to be in a room listening to my oh geez yeah i'm, I'm not gonna be sleeping tonight folks i'm imagining an old woman at the foot of my bed making me listen to my recording of this song but in my defense that was a song 
that had a tune. <laughs> right. And lots of times I've just written poems that didn't have a tune. So that's even worse. I, I think I I heard a little bit of uh, Christopher Walken there just for a second. I'd be damned if I'd listened to the song all the way through. I'm sorry. To me, it's like a sappy high school thing. Yeah. And you know what? If you are a big fan of poetry or if you're a writer of poetry, I'm sure your stuff is much better than mine is. Yeah. And much That's better than a lot of the stuff. Saying. A huge monster. <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's interesting because there's poems out there that I wouldn't even know. They they don't rhyme. They don't follow me. Maybe they do follow meter. I don't know. But uh, like, for example, I listen to Starship Sofa a lot. He likes to say that his show is a magazine, and so every time he does a show, he tries to throw in a main story, a flash story, a fact article, and often he'll throw in a poem, too, at the start. And most of the time, I can't tell that it's poetry. It doesn't rhyme, It does, and maybe it does, and it's just not read in a rhymy way. They just read it as the punctuation defines it to be read or so. I don't know what it is, but I hear that and I'm like, well, that was a poem? That didn't seem like a poem to me. But maybe that's the reason I don't like poetry is because I just don't get it. I don't understand it. It's something for people that are smarter than I am probably is the problem. Yeah, part of my stipulation of reading the poem on the air was I made you read it like it was metered. And I remember that you did not want to do that. And I pitched a fit and I was like, either you read it the way I want to or I'm going to replace you and the robot. It's okay. It's okay. Just let it go, 80T. I, I said it in an old prospector voice too, so you knew I was serious. <laughs> you spoke to a well-regarded, recognizable name, author asking him if we could do one of his stories one time. And if I recall correctly, he emailed you back and said, no. But I've got a couple of poems that you could do on the air, and uh, I believe you recycled that email. <laughs> Am I wrong in saying that? No, that's true. I considered doing it anyways just because of the guy's name. But yeah, poetry's just not my thing. I'll bet there are tons of poetry podcasts out there the same way there are these fiction yeah, podcasts. Be. You know what would be really cool is if right now one of them was talking about how this crappy Dune Steve podcast complained about poetry for 10 minutes. Yeah, because the only thing that's worse than being talked about is not being talked about. That was Oscar Wilde that said that, huh? I don't know. Smart people would know that. I'm not smart. <laughs> yeah, but you always get the girl, and that's better. As far as Scriptopia goes, I mean, it's a very short, straightforward story, but it's amusing. I've always enjoyed the somebody goes into town and there's a very unusual part of this town. It's always out in the country somewhere, secluded. And, you know, I think that's part of what drew me to this premise. The subject line of this contest was just, I, I like those stories of somebody's car breaks down and they stumble into a little town and everything in the town is not right. The Lottery by Shirley Jackson is one of those stories. And... That's a scary-ass story, dude. <laughs> and you know that George W. Bush was president of that little town. Anyhow. <laughs> hey, no politics allowed on my show. I don't think we've gotten to that episode where you complain about politics yet. So, haha, <laughs> it's staying in. Warning. Today's episode contained comments from Rich Outfield. Listener discretion is advised. So, Big, do you want to explain sort of how these stories, these three that we're doing today... These are winners, right? right? I'll explain the way we judged the submissions for this uh, event. The entrance, if you will. You use my words against me, spirit. For example, the very first story we start up with is Kevin Anderson, who's somebody that's been on our show before. And I didn't want people to feel like this contest was just rigged for people like that. Oh, it's a Kevin Anderson. Well, that one's going to be in. So this is the way we went about judging them. At the time, we had about seven or eight associate editors. These are the people who help us go through our submissions and choose the uh, worthy ones for this show. I took every submission that came into us. I removed the author's name from the subject line, from the body of the email, from anywhere in it. And then I sent it off to these people blind. They had no idea who the authors were. Because the stories are all based on the same premise, 
we thought that, well, they should probably be judged against one another and not just on their own merit. So everybody had to read all of the submissions. That's right. They gave us a score for each uh, submission that they got from 1 to 10. And then I plugged those all into a spreadsheet and the averaged scores. them out. And whoever had the highest average were the ones that won the contest. And they got to have their story done by the fabulous Doonstief guys. Anyways. We, we are fabulous. Oh, yes. Rish and I also went through and put in our scores for all the stories as well. One of the things that I found was that the best part about this contest was being able to read all the stories and see all the different takes that everybody had on the same premise. And while we can't podcast every single story that people sent in, we did decide that we wanted to make sure that everybody else could have that same experience that we could have. So I asked everybody who entered the contest if we could put their story up as in text on our website. So we've gone ahead and done that. And if you go to the website, there's a, a little tab on the side that you can click on that will take you to the Broken Mirror Stories. And you can read all of the entrants. And so you can get that same experience. That was the funnest thing for me was being able to see, oh, this person did this and this person took it that way and this person took it that way. And it was really cool to see how similar many of them were in, in many ways, but yet also how very different different they were. We had a lot of submissions, way more than we had for the October Scary Story event, which was just a scary story. To me, that meant a lot that people were willing, you know, and even if we're not podcasting your story, and I think at one point we kicked around the idea of doing every single one of them, <laughs> right? And we yeah. said, okay, we'll do it for like two months and we'll just do all the stories like we're doing right now with multiple stories in each one. But we, we couldn't. It, it takes months. Yeah, it was just too much, unfortunately. So we decided we'd take the top few, the ones with the highest average scores and... and as many as we could handle. So we've decided we're going to do two episodes with three stories each in them. So it'll give you a taste, at least, of what the Broken Mirror story event was all about. And then from there, you can go and read the rest of them off of the website if you want. But yeah, we just wanted to make sure that everybody got that experience. Because it was definitely the best part. It was just really interesting. Okay, so moving on from there, we've got our final story for the night. Or the day, or whenever it is you may be listening to this. It's always night in the Dunstief. <laughs> Wait, this isn't Scary Story event. This is Broken Mirror event. Coming up now, we've got Chemo, the Town of Golden Woods by J.M. Perkins. J.M. Perkins is a writer from San Diego, California. He writes science fiction, fantasy, horror, and whatever else he feels inclined to. You can find links to his published works and his assorted blather at strugglingwordguy.blogspot.com. Please show you care. Help him win the Google fight against J.M. Perkins, the Amazon reviewer for the children. Chemo, The Town of Golden Woods, by J.M. Perkins. I looked and saw the beasts of the field, the submen and overmen, the monsters and parasites. I watched them growing, breeding, undying like a thousand cancers, over the body of mankind. And I cried out, Who, who can kill these cancers before the body dies? Book of Chemo, chapter 29, verse 14. I sat listening to the whirl of the airplane turbine. I tried not to eye Burke, who was busy pretending not to know me. He sat in the aisle across from me, idly flipping through some men's magazine. I tried hard not to think about how many ways this could go wrong. 
Because if it went wrong, Burke was going to kill me. I sighed. Sometimes I miss the straightforwardness of zombies. Of course, if I screwed up clearing an infestation of the undead, Burke would kill me just the same. But when dropping in on a mindless horde, you know what to expect. When sent in blind, you were either bored half to death, or showed a dozen new ways you could die, or worse. I hate blind drops. We lost contact with an agent. He was on leave in his hometown, a place called Golden Woods. By all accounts, it's a nice enough suburb. There was a ring of three of us sitting around my old trainer, Instructor Jones. Why are we having a meeting? Said Burke. Who is it that went soft, AWOL? No one any of you know. An Agent Goldstein. But it's more who we sent after Goldstein. We sent Matthew Ryden. Burke swore. Fuck. He was the only person I've ever known who could drop an F-bomb with complete monotone. Who the hell is Ryden? I whispered at Julia. She had started a year earlier, so she was more than willing to fill me in on all chemo history that nobody else thought to mention. Supreme badass. Kinda like Burke. They usually send him to collect anyone who's gone wayward. I blanched. That's seriously messed up. If you try to leave, they dispatch agents after you? Julia shook her head. It isn't like that. If you burn out, Ryden just talks to you. That's all. If you say no, they let you go on your way, but everyone gets a talking to before they go. Ryden's good at the talking is all. I realized that the room was silent and all eyes had turned to us. <clears throat> Jones cleared his throat, making me feel three foot tall again and caught passing notes in Mrs. Hernandez's third grade class. Moving along, continued the instructor still eyeing us with a malevolent teacher's gleam. We have since made contact with Agent Goldstein. He says he's happy where he is. He claims to have talked to Agent Ryden, but that Ryden left. We're tracking Ryden's GPS node moving steadily west, already hundreds of miles from town. But that was the locator he knew about. The one he didn't know about has stayed inside the township proper. We shifted in our seats, uncomfortable. All of us, except Burke, who just shook his head. On the one hand, an agent was in danger. On the other hand, we had just been let in on yet another troubling secret of chemo. I was worried that these kinds of revelations would just keep coming. The next drop of information not arriving till we were thrust into even greater danger. Oh, please. Don't all look like you're suffering whiny existential dilemmas, people. An agent is in trouble. Are you in? We mumbled yes. something affirmative. Burke nodded. All right, be careful. We're sending you in as blind as you can get. We've already dispatched another three. You're going separately, arriving on your own. Burke's in charge. Julie and Joseph, you're both selected for this because you're new enough that Ryden and Goldstein won't recognize you. I don't know what's going on in Golden Woods, but don't take any chances. No offense, Burke. But if they took out Raiden, they can take you out. All your standard authorizations remain in place. Assume Goldstein has gone native, helping his hometown develop countermeasures. Julia, you're leaving in about five hours. Burke and Joseph have the same flight in seven hours. Our plane landed without incident. From here, we were supposed to rent separate cars and arrive within an hour or two. Julia was already in town. The other three, they hadn't bothered to tell us who they were yet, had been in town for over a day preparing. We were going to subtly take over this town, quietly enough that the locals wouldn't even know it. Unless Goldstein tipped them off. Unless Goldstein was better than us. I checked into my hotel under my assumed name. Across town at the bed and breakfast, I knew Burke was doing the same. I giggled at an image of him, hemmed in by antiques and a nosy, doting old couple. I put the card key into the door and unlocked my room. Julia was already inside. How did you... Shh. I noticed that there were three more people in the room. 
The other agents, I presumed. They were all ringed around a cell phone. Low voices came out of the tiny speaker. Julia mouthed, whispered, It's Burke. Ryden and Goldstein were waiting for him. I reached into my jacket to touch one of my guns for reassurance. Bad habit. One of the agents made the finger talk, Peace. Julia mouth whispered some more. Relax. You're just talking. I don't think they know he called me. Phone's in his pocket. I squatted next to the ad hoc piece of surveillance tech. A man's voice was barely audible. Slow in your old age, Burke. Goldstein spotted you almost before I did. But we knew you'd come. Kimo would never just accept that we are happy here. That we're tired of all the killing and the dying. We just want to be people again. You know how many agents I've talked out of retiring? Forty-seven. Came Burke's flat middle tone, much louder than the voice I assumed belonged to Ryden. Yeah, but even with all the talk about contamination, those Nietzsche quotes endlessly recycling, they don't buy that I was affected. I've been affected. Goldstein convinced me. Have you even looked around? I know you've identified all the threats for 50 miles, but have you seen? This is a nice town, Burke. I may not stay here, but this is as good a place as any to start my retirement. I understand. Despite my reputation, I know how the job wears down on us. It wears down on me, too. I'm going to stick around. Actually finish my stay here. But I believe you, Raiden. And in the end, Kimo will let you go. They just don't like to be lied to. Long silence. I know, but I didn't think they'd just let me go. I still don't know. We'll see, I guess, won't we, Burke? There were shuffling, scuffing movements. Oh, and Burke, tell the others... All the agentlings clustered about the speakerphone in the Handers Hotel to relax. These are good people. We don't want any trouble. I didn't know what to think about Goldstein, but Ryden was good. Very good. Better than us. Maybe better than Burke. So what did we learn? Burke asked. After the conversation had ended, Burke had instructed us all to meet at the local chain coffee shop. We did our best to look inconspicuous as the employees tidied the place for closing. We've been marked, said one of the other three, and Agent Howard. Burke snorted. Huh. Although I should reprimand you for meeting in one room, I can't. This town is just too small. Even though Goldstein and Ryden didn't know any of you, they just had to watch for any stranger coming in. We didn't have the cover of a big city. It's all the cloak and dagger bullshit. But what else have we learned? Nobody offered a response. I knew by his tone that there was something I'd missed. And it embarrassed me. I fumbled for something, anything to say. It's actually a kind of nice town? Bert cocked his head like the RCA phonograph dog. Everyone else looked at me like I was special. You know... It is, Burke said, taking a long drink of his coffee-derived beverage. All right, let's go take a walk. The five of us followed Burke, who tossed his cup into a trash can. Zigging and zagging, we found ourselves in an alley dead-ending in some light commercial buildings. Burke gave the sign for lookout. I strained my senses, trying to catch sound or whiff or sight of any watchers, of any monitoring gear. Burke pulled out a small device that blasted the surrounding area with electromagnetic pulse, frying any gear that could be watching us now. Unfortunately, since he hadn't given us any warning, it also fried our little scraps of tech. I was grateful I had a backup phone in the hotel. Talk fast. Talk low. They might already be on to us, said Burke. What? Who? asked Julia. Them. Everyone. I noticed it with Goldstein and Ryden. They were the same. They were in sync. It was their heartbeats. But I didn't really notice until the blinking struck me. They blink in unison. It 
it's unsettling. Okay, but that could be a fluke. Some side effect of paradigm training, maybe. Like they're stuck in calm. Or maybe something they were exposed to on a mission. Offered Howard. Burke shook his head. That's the thing. It's not just them. It's everyone. The old couple at my inn. The gas station attendant. And even that barista back there. Same slow, steady heart rate. The same utter lack of stress. And that doesn't just happen naturally. Something is going on here. Something not normal. I bit my lip. I've already messaged the higher-ups. They're supposed to set up a precautionary quarantine within a few days. Either we figure out just what is going on, or we get out quick. This is something new. But how do we know it's bad? How do we know this qualifies as a cancer of the body? Asked Julia. I mean, it just seems like everyone is more relaxed. So what? Burke sighed. I know what you're feeling, Agent Julia. I knew Ryden before all this. He was always stressed. I've never seen him so... happy. And I wish it were real that this town simply was that good. But something is up. Body snatchers, mind control, who knows. We have to assume the worst so we won't get caught off guard. Burke sucked in a deep breath before continuing. (sighs) Okay, here's how we're going to work this. I need you all to take on investigatory and cautious paradigms as strongly as you can manage, now. Nobody seems up this late, so we'll split into pairs and fan out first thing tomorrow. I focused on the internalized rituals. I mentally spun the symbols and emotionally charged songs that would shift my consciousness, focus me on the outlook and personality traits I would need to be the best investigator, the most cautious person I could possibly be. A question from one of the others derailed me. What are we looking for? Asked Agent Howard. Anything we can find, said Burke. He pulled out his 9mm, ready to round. Of all the paradigms I've been taught so far, of all the ways that I stretched and tried to mold my personality into useful shapes, Cautious was my least favorite. This is because Cautious was a misnomer. Batshit paranoid is closer to how I was taught to manifest Cautious. I was barely able to sleep my allotted two hours that next day, and as bad as the hotel room to which we all retreated was, trying to explore the town on Cautious was even worse. I focused on sifting through all my sensory input. Before chemo, before training, I had no idea how much information we took in all the time. Most humans, for most of their lives, choose to focus on one tiny square of vision. You can see a wide expanse, but you consciously lower the volume of your awareness to stave off the overwhelming crush of your senses. Usually. But when you're starving, looking for food, you notice everything. When you're terrified, you can hear every creak and squeak. Being in the cautious aspect is like that, but worse. Julia and I explored. Every engine noise, every flip of the hair threatened to send me reeling. The fear, the desperate urge to get to a quiet, safe place where I could watch the only entrance exit was almost more than I could bear. But my cautious aspect was tempered by the opposing investigate paradigm. I couldn't help but try to make patterns, find anomalies, and manufacture answers and explanations. I've heard that others talk about how experienced agents can hold paradigms for days on end or how they can cycle from aspect to aspect without resetting to baseline. I had recently developed the focus needed to manage two simultaneous aspects at the same time, but anything longer than seven hours made me feel as though my brain were fracturing under the weight. I was on hour ten of holding investigate and cautious. We found nothing. Even with my hopped up sight, Even under the constant grip of my paranoia, I still couldn't get a sense of what was going on. Everyone seemed to be cheerfully doing their jobs. I had a moment where the color red seemed to be marking something. 
but it was nonsense. You getting anything? I asked, trying to keep all the volume out of my voice. Nothing, replied Julia. I was about ready to press the button on the side of my earpiece, call Burke and tell him we hadn't found anything. We turned down a residential street, pleasant sidewalks and ringing columns of trees. Wait, said Julia. I smashed the brake, stopping the car. Something is wrong with the school, she said. What? I'm not sure. Just wait. We sat in the rental sedan, watching what seemed like a calm, normal school. The longer I looked at the place, the more it seemed... off. Then it struck me. Where are the kids? I parked as fast as the little car allowed. We jumped from the vehicle, allowing our investigative aspect to overwhelm all the caution signals our fear subroutines were throwing at us. We ran through the campus, opening doors and rushing down halls. Nothing and no one. I heard panting behind us, heavy breathing coming from around the corner. Julia took cover and readied herself for a fight. I resisted the urge to draw my own weapon. Instead, I fixated on the need to defuse the situation and try to extract more information. A chubby security guard came into sight. He raised a hand as if to stop us. Folks, you gotta get out of here. This is private property. Where is everybody? I was supposed to see the principal about a job. Um, <clears throat> the Renikop snorted. We both know that's a lie. He smiled and his heart rate began to fall after his brief span of exertion. Where is everybody? I repeated myself. We can't help you, sir. Do you need to be escorted out? Okay. I began to walk towards the exit. But I went to ask a third time, twisting the inflection, just so to try to compel an answer. Where are all the kids? The security guard said nothing for a while, hung his head and looked at the ground. I made the hand signal for Julia to come out of hiding. The interloper didn't seem to notice as she emerged. And finally, the fat man spoke. The kids. There was a gas leak. School's closed down until we fix it. Uh-huh, I said, trying to figure out the best way to proceed. I was cut off by Burke's voice in my ear. Meet me back in my room at the bed and breakfast, quick as you can. Can't talk this way. It's all hollow, said Burke. I tried not to think about chocolate Easter bunnies. Julia spoke for us. Yeah, we found a school completely deserted. It was the same with us. Burke nodded at Agent Howard to keep speaking. We went into the office district. All the fast food places were fully manned, even at customers, but it was all for show. When we barged into the buildings at random, they were empty. Nobody was eating the food, just sitting in the places they thought we might go, going through the motions, added Burke. So it's all a prop, a, a stage? I said, trailing off when I heard two men in the hallway. I hadn't finished purging the scraps of cautious, so I stilled the brewing panic attack. As usual, when in doubt, I watched Burke. I figured if I just acted like him, everything would probably be okay. Burke sat, unmoving. My hand inched toward the shoulder holster all the same. I would need the head start if I were to draw as fast as he could. The door opened. I relaxed. The two agents whose names I had forgotten entered the crowded room. They walked over, sat on the oversoft bed. Burke was up, his gun drawn. I pulled mine as quickly as I could. Yup, when in doubt, do as Burke does. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait just a minute. Julia said. Get the zip ties and bind them. Burke responded. Not until you explain just what the hell is going on here. Just listen. Silence fell on the room. The men seemed unperturbed. Calm. Damn it. I cursed. It was the same low, steady, da dump da dump Burke had heard last night. The same heartbeat we'd been hearing all day. And the agents, or whatever they were now, just sat there, smiling. We are fucked. We are fucked. We are so, so fucked. It's in the air. It's in us already. Oh, fuck. Fuck. I felt about the same, but decided it was better to stay quiet. It's not in the air. Sensor didn't pick up anything. 
said Julia, trying to be reasonable. Burke just stared at the two agents, studying them. They still looked like the agents anyway. But who knew what they were now? I spoke up. If it were in the air, we'd have already gotten it. I don't know, this is some mind-jack bullshit. Or some parasite. Man, this is fucked. Please Please allow allow us to explain, explain, both agents suddenly said as one. You You have have to to understand. understand. It has has been been difficult difficult for us to put on the show for you these past few days. Difficult Difficult to produce the illusion that there there is not the unity. What are you? Asked Burke. We are unity. We are all as one. We are every brain and body in this town united, sharing our thoughts, our emotions, our all. Please, you must understand. We need your help. Please. What have you done with my friends? Said Burke, for the first time letting some anger seep into his voice. Please. We sent these bodies because you knew them. We stripped the weapons so you would not identify them as threats. Please, you must understand. You must help us. Help you? Help you? I repeat again, what the hell have you done with my friends? Burke screamed. It was the first time I had heard him raise his voice. The two... whatever blinked. I almost got a sense that voices, many... Many voices were conferring. Every Every man, man, every every woman has has structures built into themselves to keep their sense of self separate. In our town, we discovered the words, the programming to route around those controls. You're not answering my questions! Burke flipped open his switchblade. It glittered in the sunlight from the window for a moment, before Burke stabbed it through one of the agent's hands into the wooden armrest of the chair. The agents screamed, both of them. We didn't know if they could really share their all, but it was simple enough to tell that they had acted as though they had both been stabbed. Why? Why Why did did you you do do that? that? The former agents said, tears streaming down their faces. You weren't answering my questions. Now, tell me exactly what you did to our agents. Burke pulled back the blade, wiping it off. The former agents winced. We We exposed exposed them them to to the words and and to to the the symbols. They listened, they they saw and understood. While we mirrored their posture, their their rhythm, and and then they they were were in. They They were were with us. They They were were part of us. You stole these men. You took their minds, Burke said, disgust curling his lips. These These bodies, bodies, we we had had to take them. them. We We had had to talk talk with you, had to try to make you understand. But the first one, and the one who followed him, they joined the unity of their own accord. Please believe us. Nothing will be lost in the unity. Nothing. These men have only gained as you will gain. Now we have little time, and that is why we didn't wait to convince these bodies. You You must must call off chemo. You You must must tell them them that everything is all right. Burke said nothing. The men were silent for a while, and once again I got the impression of many voices conferring. But But you you won't. Now Now that that we are are here, here, we see that. that. How How could a monster, a killer, killer understand? You You must must become become part of all in one. one. We haven't much time. We We will will not not allow your organization to kill us. We We will will not lose what what humanity has struggled so long to achieve. Julia interrupted. Uh, guys? Kind of surrounded. She opened the curtains just a bit, but we could see that the parking lot was full of men and women and children. A few carried weapons. The majority were unarmed. When the agent spoke... Every person surrounding the hotel mouthed the words in whispers. You will come with us to to the the keepers keepers of the the book. Joseph and Julia, cover their eyes, gag them, and throw them into the bathroom. We moved without thought to comply with Burke's orders. Agent Howard... 
I need you to shift to Berserker Aspect. Howard let out a long, loud stream of fluent cursing, but he closed his eyes and began all the same. Depending on how adept Howard was, and I am sure Burke had an accurate estimate down to the minute, we had maybe three minutes or so before Howard would need to be unleashed against something. The eyes and ears of all-in-one secured, we squatted with Burke to hash out a quick plan. Howard is going to cut a path for us. The agent began convulsing, frothy saliva beginning to leak from his mouth. We are going to follow close. We need to get to a vehicle. If we get separated, we'll meet at the prearranged rendezvous, Zulu 5 Golf. Understood. Howard, do you understand? The agent continued to seize there on the floor of the bed and breakfast. Burke raised his voice, yelling, Howard, do you understand? The agent growled a little, but raised his hand and a thumbs up. Let's go. We grabbed as many guns out of Burke's cases as we could run with and sprinted out of the room. We rushed down two flights of stairs, paused at the back door. You ready, Howard? The agent turned and looked squarely at Burke. Madness and bloodlust only barely contained gleamed in his eye. He nodded. Burke opened the door. Howard leapt out, satisfied. The berserk he had called out. The berserk he had had to contain until the time was right could finally be let loose. Howard screamed to the heavens, there in the bed and breakfast parking lot. The ringing waves of bodies were taken aback. And in their brief minute of confusion and incomprehension, it began. There is a dirty little secret about going berserk, something that I've never heard any other agent confess. It's fun. There's a deep, personal, and professional satisfaction that comes from kicking ass. But shifting to berserk isn't like that at all. When you go berserk, you just want something to bleed. Like the cautious paradigm, you identify everything as a threat. But unlike the cautious aspect we had all used earlier that day, this threat identification strokes a different emotional trigger. You want to kill each and every last stinking one of them. Who they are is subject to change, and you really, truly feel like you can accomplish that all by yourself. It's troubling that half the time you're right. It's even more troubling that no matter what you do when you're in the rage aspect, if you kill kids, pregnant ladies, or the angels themselves, you'll never regret it. You remember how much you enjoyed the feel of flesh rending beneath your fingers, of blood squirting into your mouth, of bodies and lives giving way and falling before you. But there is no guilt, no remorse, only the memory of fun. The fact that it isn't troubling is the most troubling thing of all. With tooth and nail, with gun and blade, I've come, screamed Howard, reciting the opening lines of one of Kimo's battle hymns. He began firing with the butt of his assault rifle shoved into his shoulder. Every shell found its home, buried in one of the bodies. We gave him space and time to move forward, since we sure as hell didn't want to be confused with the enemy. He fought on and we targeted the scattering armed individuals or anyone who got too close to Agent Howard. I've been in fights before, fights where one side, the other side, is obliterated. This was the most one-sided, because every time we shot one of them, the others would feel it. At first, whenever one of them got tagged, the others would spasm, sometimes fall over. If I had allowed it to be, it would have been heartbreaking. But they got over it. There must have been too much pain. It stopped affecting them so much, but they still flinched with every bullet. So we kept firing, and they kept dying by the dozen. They would have lost. They weren't skilled, and feeling one another's pain was a severe disadvantage. But there was just so many of them. Hundreds, if not thousands. It seemed as though the entire town were converging on this parking lot. 
Howard had already emptied both his rifle and sidearm. He had wrenched a kitchen knife away from some old woman and was stabbing and biting his way onward. I'm empty, shouted Julia. So am I, yelled Burke, his switchblade dancing away. I heard my last shell explode outward. I'm... I was cut off by a bullet. <laughs> Howled Burke. He fell, around, bursting through and buckling his leg. Agent Howard went down, kicking and clawing. I saw him crushed beneath the press of bodies, heard his frenzied cursing quiet. I turned and saw who'd shot Burke. Goldstein and Ryden were above us, on the roof and brandishing a pair of chemo-issued sniper rifles. Two red dots floated steady on Julia and me. Burke rolled in pain on the ground. Surrender! said every last man, woman, and child there on the asphalt. Even though they didn't raise their individual voices, the flawless chorus was deafening. A shudder went through me as I realized the full scale of the whole. Ryden and Goldstein forced us to walk down the street, while they followed several paces behind us. We carried Burke between our shoulders. Agent Howard was dead. We had no doubt they would shoot us if we twitched wrong, probably in the leg like they had done to neutralize Burke. We could have fought, but we knew enough to conserve our strength. Not that it would do any good. We We apologize. apologize. We We never never wanted wanted this. this. But you will understand soon. Nothing will be lost. But if we are to survive and carry on, we need you with us. We need to spread. We need to leave, said Ryden and Goldstein together. Fuck off, said Burke. With his hands, he sent a different message to us in finger talk. Trust. Follow. I have plan. I was very relieved by this. We turned a corner and saw the same school Julia and I had explored earlier. But now it was bustling, a hub of activity. Thousands had gathered, watching our approach in utter silence. I really fucking hate blind drops. They lashed us to chairs with the same type of plastic zip ties we had used to secure the other agents. Goldstein and Ryden talked as they worked. It was a student who showed us the way. The empathy, the capacity to be together was with us all the time. We just needed the words. We just needed the symbols. We just needed the book to be written. But the word doesn't work on its own. We needed the sink. Masses sat on the grass, watching. Hundreds more worked around the periphery, fashioning weapons, writing in notebooks, and distributing food. They all smiled. They were all smiling at us. I don't think they ever stopped smiling. You You will will be be first, Burke. Burke. We We need need you and what what is in your your mind the most. Burke shuddered. I had never seen him afraid before. His hands bound, he was forced to speak aloud. When they begin, look away. They taped Burke's eyes open. Another seat was placed in the grass courtyard we were all in, and a man sat across from Burke. The townsperson sped his breathing to match Burke. The man rubbed his leg as though he were in pain. A child, maybe second grade age, brought out a book. He began to read... And as he read, he showed Burke the pages. Makes us sad to be lonely alone, the child said, flipping open the page for Burke to read. The entire assembled mass spoke with him, as though at a sacred church rite. Look away! screamed Burke as he struggled and thrashed about in his bonds. I shut my eyes tight and began to loop a Beach Boys song in my head. Getting a song stuck in your head, especially if you do it consciously, is one of a handful of ways to effectively block out the world. I only caught snippets of what happened next. I'm picking up good vibrations. So we we can can be be together, together, spoke the child's voice, backed by thousands more. 
She's giving me excitations. I sang out loud, trying not to hear, trying not to be contaminated by what was happening to Burke. You just, you just have, have to, to learn to hear the others. others. You can hear them anytime. <laughs> Screams and howls as though demons had been loosed echoed upon the school from all sides. Gunshots rang out and countless voices sang with rage and pain and fear. I wanted to look, to see, but I sat bound in my chair, squeezing my eyes shut as tight as I could. Good, 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 good vibrations. I sang, trying not to listen to the world breaking. We were saved by agents in hazmat suits. I was quarantined for two weeks, and now I'm sitting here talking to you, I said to my debriefer, having just recounted the whole sorry, sordid tale. I had been scrubbed down, poked and prodded, and tested for weeks. And now I was here trying to explain it all. So you have no idea what happened? What Burke did? I had an idea, but I always found it useful to play dumber than I was in interviews. I shook my head. When the residents of Golden Woods attempted to incorporate Burke into their so-called All is One, he was cycling to berserk aspect. I nodded. That had been my guess. The blood madness spread. They felt as he felt, and they tore themselves apart because of it. Yeah, I saw the bodies. There had been many bodies. There were only a few survivors. Most of them are either raving insane or catatonic. Makes sense, I suppose, considering what they did, what they felt. Most of the ones left truncated themselves from the unity to become separate and safe. What are we going to do with them? The survivors are under heavy guard, and we'll be observing them for now. If the long-term trauma is within tolerable levels, we'll probably train some as agents. I nodded again. All standard procedure. The interviewing agent closed his book. You did good, Agent Joseph. And you check out fine. We're going to grant you twice standard post-mission leave to relax. Can I see Julia and Burke? The interviewer took a deep breath. <sighs> yes, well, Julia has already left, but you can certainly see her when she gets back. As for Burke... What? Burke was actually brought into the All is One. He told us that he understood it, that he understood himself and his fellow man at that moment. And then he felt the rage leak from him, felt himself tearing apart the most beautiful thing he'd ever been a part of. He watched it all die, didn't have any choice. I looked down at the table between us. Suffice to say, we don't know what the effects will be. We know he did the right thing. But whenever we discuss it with him, he calmly tells us that he destroyed humanity's great hope. Oh. I didn't know what else to say. So I got up to leave. Maybe sometime soon, you can talk to Burke yourself. But for now, it's... We'll have to wait and see. Yeah. I walked out of the small office, out of the nondescript building that housed one thin tendril of chemo. I walked out into a sunlit world that didn't know who we were or what we did or why. I knew they would be watching my every move. I had no idea what I would do when I saw Julia again. I missed Burke. I missed the feeling of being with someone who knew what they were doing. I ambled towards the airport, resolved to take the first flight to anywhere. As I walked, I sang to myself, Gotta keep those lovely vibrations I have. Author's note. Hi, Rish and Big and listener. Let me tell you about writing Chemo, Town of Golden Woods. 
I got excited about Dune Steve's Broken Mirror contest and immediately thought of an idea of how it could fit into my novel about the secret society slash cult that has dedicated itself to eradicating cancers from the body of mankind. I'm very pleased with the result, and think it works well as a standalone short fiction piece. I hope you agree. Apparently, having a deadline is a great motivator for me because the story came rather quickly, leaving me plenty of time to edit, which is something I generally struggle with. My only complaint is what happened to Burke. I'm oddly fond of that guy, and can only take solace in the fact that as Goldenwood appears somewhere towards the middle of the novel, there is more Burke to come, both before and after. But I guess you'll have to subscribe to my blog to learn more. All right, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that last story. It's good stuff. Don't give me that look. I will not change my ways. You wipe that smirk right off your face. I was hit by Smilex gas. It's not a smirk. <laughs> I'm on medication, but it's going to be a while. So, Chemo, the town of Golden Woods. Uh, first things first. Loved reading the two characters speak at once <laughs> thing. I, I really enjoy doing this podcast. And I love doing the lists. I love doing the funny voices. I love doing the readings and the banter. But wow, way, way up there was doing the two voices simultaneous <laughs> reading thing. And I hope that people can understand what the Yeah, I hope say. it translated across for the people that were listening. We did have to start over because one of us started a little early or got off sync. I guess our heartbeats weren't exactly even. But strangely, not that many times did we have to restart ourselves when we were doing that stuff. We talked about poetry and how it sucks. <laughs> But that was something like poetry or a song, music, with a meter. And, and right. we needed to read it at exactly the same speed. And the only other time that we've ever done that was back on the Sadie Worth episode. Right. In that one, we had people in various locations, each playing a character, and then they all had to chant, I believe, in Sadie Worth at the same time. So ultimately, what you did was you gave them our recording of us chanting and said, you guys need to listen to this and match it exactly. And they did, right? Pretty much, yeah. I think uh, a lot of them had to just play it out loud and talk along with it. So if you could hear the raw recording of them, you might hear us in the background coming out of the speaker. The Sadie Worth stuff matched up pretty good, but when you're not in the same room as somebody, it's not as easy to chant along with them like like we did with the lines that we were doing since we were sitting right next to each other. And when we screwed up, we could step back and start over. Well, this was harder, though. Because chanting, it doesn't matter if somebody is saying, I believe in Sadie Worth, while everybody is, I believe in Sadie Worth. This, though, we were essentially the same mind. Right. I don't know. It just sounds like I'm boasting at this point. I, I just, <laughs> thank you, John, for giving us the opportunity to do that. That was that was fun, man. Yeah, it was good stuff. So like he said in his author's note, this comes from a larger story, apparently, and uh, if you'd like to know more about it, swing over to his blog that he mentioned. There, there's a link in the show notes, and you can swing over there and check it out and find out what that's all about. I'm, um, I'm joined to check it out. This world was interesting to me, and, and the story it only touched the surface. Right. I wanted to know what else was going on with these guys and the this, this organization. And uh, – this was sort of a military science fiction story, you know, sort of a Robert yeah. Heinlein kind yeah, I of think you're right. James Cameron military sort of thing. And then that's what was in my mind was was sort of aliens <laughs> and all the Marines. Although these guys were more like James Bond Marines or something like that. Uh, it, it was fun to be the character of Burke, be, act out the character of Burke. Perform. Per perform. Listen to that performed by Ethan Hawke. Sometimes, and I don't know if this is a self-criticism or if this is boasting or somewhere in between, but sometimes it takes a few minutes before I get into the mindset of a certain character. And with this guy, probably the first couple line readings aren't where it later became, where I could see this guy in my head. And to be honest, I think I was channeling a little bit of Clint Eastwood during the reading. Just some gruff, very capable, very competent, takes no crap kind of guy. Right. Very Dirty Harry-esque. Yeah. 
I don't know. This was fun stuff. I am going to check out John's chemo. It was a novel, right? Yeah. I don't know exactly how they fit together. I guess you have to go over to his blog to find out. Before you head over there, let's go ahead and send everybody off. Oh, yeah. I, I wasn't going to do it while you were recording. I'm... I, Okay, I frankly actually was. I, I had already forgotten you were even in the room. All right, thanks, man. Hey, uh, so yeah, that was our first episode of the uh, Broken Mirror Story. Tune in next time for the uh, final three stories that we're going to present to you. Thanks for listening. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. Ah, oh, my, my. What elation. I don't know where, but she sends me there. Good night. See ya. Thank you for listening. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So please share our show with everyone you know, but don't alter the files or try to sell them. Take two. Burke swore. He was the only person I've ever known who could drop an F-bomb with complete monotone. Fuck. Get the zip ties and bind them. <laughs> and in the darkness, bind them. <laughs> I don't know why that's funny to me. It's not. Get the zip ties and bind them. With the one ring to rule them all. Asked Julia. I better move my hand. I was getting a weird sound to my voice. Asked Julia. Hey, you ruined my take. How weird did that sound to your ears? Shit, fuck, damn, fuck, shit, fuck, damn, fuck, 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 Barbara Streisand! Shit, fuck, 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 Okay, seriously, that's all you're getting in that? Because that is really starting to hurt my head. Huh, I'm going to cut a path for them. Sweet. <laughs> for I will need to be unleashed against something. That's awesome. Oh, oh, I have to get killed? Shit. A bunch of growls and shouts and grunting and stuff that you might imagine a guy in berserker mode might make. <laughs> this is like exercise. Like using my whole stomach. <laughs>